This is Rashna Kapadia's Smart History Khan Academy essay on Bichitur's Jahangir, preferring a Sufi sheikh to kings. When Akbar, the third emperor of the Mughal dynasty, had no living heir at age 28, he consulted with a Sufi, an Islamic mystic, Sheikh Salim, who assured him a son would come. Soon after, when a male child was born, he was named Salim. Upon his ascent to the throne in 1605, Prince Salim decided to give himself the honorific title of Nur Uddin, Light of Faith, and the name Jahangir, Caesar of the World. In this miniature painting, Jahangir, preferring a Sufi sheikh to kings, flames of gold radiate from the emperor's head against a background of a larger, darker gold disc. A slim crescent moon hugs most of the disc's border, creating a harmonious fusion between the sun and the moon, thus day and night, and symbolizing the ruler's emperorship and divine truth. Jahangir is shown seated on an elevated stone-studded platform, whose circular form mimics the disc above. The emperor is the biggest of the five human figures painted, and the disc with his halo, a visual manifestation of his title of honor, is the largest object in the painting. Jahangir faces four bearded men of varying ethnicity, who stand in a receiving line format on a blue carpet embellished with arabesque flower designs and fanciful beast motifs. Almost on par with the emperor's level stands the Sufi sheikh, who accepts the gifted book, a hint of a smile brightening his face. By engaging directly only with the sheikh, Jahangir is making a statement about his spiritual leanings. Inscriptions in the cartouches on the top and bottom margins of the folio reiterate the fact that the emperor favors visitation with a holy man over an audience with kings. Below the sheikh, and thus second in the hierarchical order of importance, stands an Ottoman sultan. The unidentified leader, dressed in gold-embroidered green clothing and a turban tied in a style that distinguishes him as a foreigner, looks in the direction of the throne, his hands joined in respectful supplication. The third standing figure awaiting a reception with the emperor has been identified as King James I of England. By his European attire, plumed hat worn at a tilt, pink cloak, fitted shirt with a lace ruff and elaborate jewelry, he appears distinctive. His uniquely, frontal, his uniquely frontal posture and direct gaze also make him pure indecorous and perhaps even uneasy. Last in line is Bichitur, the artist responsible for this miniature, shown wearing an understated yellow jama robe tied on his left, which indicates that he is a Hindu in service at the Mughal court. Reminder that artists who created Islamic art were not always Muslim. This miniature folio was once part of a muraka, or album, which would typically have had alternating folios containing calligraphic text and painting. In all, six such albums are attributed to the rule of Jahangir and his heir, Shah Jahan, who is responsible for the Taj Mahal. But the folios, which vary greatly in subject matter, have now been widely dispersed over collections across three continents. During Mughal rule, artists were singled out for their special talents, some for their, for their detailed work in botanical paintings, others for naturalistic treatment of fauna, while some artists were lauded for their calligraphic skills. In recent scholarship, Bichitur's reputation is strong in formal portraiture, and within this category is superior rendering of hands. Clear to the observer is the stark contrast between Jahangir's gem-studded wrist bracelets and, the fin and finger rings and the sheikh's bare hands, the distinction between rich and poor, and the pursuit of material and spiritual endeavors. <clears throat> Less clear is the implied deference to the emperor by the elderly sheikh's decision to accept the imperial gift not directly in his hands, <clears throat> but in his shawl, thereby, thereby avoiding direct physical contact with a royal personage, a cultural taboo. A similar principle is at work in the action of the sultan, who presses his palms together in a respectful gesture. By agreeing to adopt the manner of greeting in the foreign country in which he is a guest, the Ottoman leader exhibits both respect and humility. King James' depiction is slightly more complex. Bichitra based his image of the English monarch on a portrait by John the something, which is believed to have been given to Jahangir by Sir Thomas Rowe, the first English ambassador to the Mughal court. This was a way to cement diplomatic relations, and gifted items went both ways, east and west. In Bichitra's miniature, only one of King James's hands can be seen, and it is worth noting that it has been positioned close to, but not touching, the hilt of his weapon. Typically, at this time, portraits of European kings depicted one hand of the monarch resting on his hip, the other on his sword. Thus, we can speculate that Bichitur deliberately altered the positioning of the king's hand to avoid an interpretation of a threat to his emperor. Finally, the artist portrays himself holding a red... Let me move back up just for a second. Finally, the artist portrays, paints himself holding a red bordered miniature painting as though it were a prized treasure. In this tiny painting within a painting, Bichitur replicates his yellow jama, 
a man's robe, perhaps to clarify his identity, and places himself along two horses and an elephant, which may have been imperial gifts. He shows himself bowing in the direction of his emperor in humble gratitude. To underscore his humility, Bichitra puts his signature on the stool over which the emperor's feet would have to step in order to take his seat. Beneath Jahangir's seat, crouching angels write in Persian, O Shah, may the span of your life be a thousand years at the base of a mighty hourglass that makes up the pedestal of Jahangir's throne. This reading is a clear allusion to the passage of time, but the Puti figures borrowed from European iconography, suspended in midair toward the top of the painting provide few clues as to their purpose or meaning. Placing away from the emperor, the Puto on the left holds a bow with a broken string and a bent arrow, while the one on the right covers his face with his hands. Does he shield his eyes from the emperor's radiance, as some scholars believe, or as others suggest, is he crying because time is running out for the emperor, as represented in the slipping sand in the hourglass? Also cryptic is the many-headed kneeling figure that forms the base of Jahangir's footstool. Questions remain as to who these auxiliary figures are and what they or their actions represent. Allegorical portraits were a popular painting genre among Jah Jahangir's court painters from 1615. To flatter their emperor, Jahangir's artists portrayed him in imagined victories over rivals and enemies or painted events reflecting imperial desire. Regardless of whether Jahangir actually met the sheikh or was visited by a real Ottoman sultan, King James I certainly did not visit the Mughal court. Bichitur has dutifully indulged his patron's desire to be seen as a powerful ruler in a position of superiority to other kings, but with a spiritual bent. While doing so, the artist has also cleverly taken the opportunity to immortalize himself.